there are still people here. Uh, normally I've made my departure um, to catch the train back, but of course as I live in Stirling it's a five minute cycle. Um, you've heard all day, we've heard all day about very long lived, well funded projects. Um, this is the complete opposite. Uh, lots of people in the room have volunteered with me. This took place over a weekend. Um, we will go back, but this is very, very small scale stuff, keyhole excavation. The first point I have to say is my title. I have not discovered a new monument type. This isn't a Kearney Brock. This rather is to do with the difficulties of classifying archaeological remains before you excavate them, which will become apparent. So first of all, location. The red star is the location. The picture to the top right is the view back to Stirling Castle from the site. And in effect, you're on high ground overlooking the curse of the fourth. So we have another quick map. Um, the dark green area 10,000 years ago is underwater. The pale green is high dry ground. This is where the settlement focuses. And just to give you Paris's medieval map, which, which is wildly inaccurate, of course, but makes the point that the dark circle within that is Stirling and Stirling Bridge. And the area to the right is the fourth floodplain. The area to, well, your left is the fourth floodplain. The area to your right is a combination of Flanders Moss and the Clyde. Well, wildly inaccurate, but just makes this point that in the prehistoric past, this was a boggy area, underwater, hard to pass. And it reflects how settlement uh, focuses on this plain. So, for example, um, just in front of Baston Burn, we think there is, in effect, not perhaps a beach, but an area of water upon which whales are washed up. And we have the famous antler beam mattock from um, Garganic, which is just, just five minutes away. And this is basically used to chop up the carcasses of whales that are washed up on this prehistoric shoreline. I should say this is not a photograph of Mesolithic activity. <laughs> right, so Baston Burn. The site is first discovered in 1954 and thought to be a dune. I will not explain what dunes are. I'm going to come back to that. Then in 1975, someone thought it was a cairn. Then in 1978, it was a dune again. <laughs> Then in 1982, it was a dune again. Then we decided in 2006 that it was a substantial roundhouse. We had three changes of status um, without anybody lifting a, t a spade in anger. Very clever. Right, oh, there's, I've got another picture there. Are, are these, uh, have these copied themselves? Oh, sorry. What we definitely know is it's not a brock. We know it's not a Brock because it's not on Ewan Mackay's paper from 1970s. And we also know it's not uh, a Brock because it's not in Lorna Main's paper from the 1990s. So it's definitely not a Brock. Fine, makes sense. What is a Brock? Um, of course, everyone is familiar with Musa. This is the classic Brock. Everybody knows that. That makes sense. The Brocks in Stirling are a bit smaller. This is Cold Up Brock. Um, which is definitely a brock. It's definitely a brock because it's on both Ewan Mackay's paper and Lorna Main's paper. Right, so we know that. What's the difference between a brock and a dune? Right, that's interesting. Or for that matter, what's the difference between a brock, a dune, a fort and a homestead? All four of these structures are around Stirling. All four of them have been excavated. All four of them involve substantial walled circular structures. All four of them are destroyed by fire. All four of them date to the middle of the first century AD. One's a brock, one's a dune, <coughs> one's a fort, one's a homestead. Now, um, that's all a bit funny. So if we refer to Ian Armit's famous paper where he looked at these differing substantial circular walled structures and came up with the term Atlantic Roundhouse. 
So you go from a simple Atlantic roundhouse to a complex Atlantic roundhouse to a Brock Tower to a Brock Village and there's a nice classification and all that makes sense. Of course, Stirling is not on the Atlantic. Uh, hence my preferred term, Brocky thing. Um, although if I'm being strictly technical, we should talk about Brock and Cognate form. Right, because there's a nice useful shorthand. Right, if you take the principles of circular walls, substantial, uh, small enough to be roofed, you go from Ewan Mackay's 8 to between 30 or 40. So just to, uh, this is, uh, the red dots are Brocky type structures, the kind of turquoise blue is the fourth in the middle, and then we have Lorna Main's map at the top, which some of the sites, there is, there is a degree of overlap, but there are actually far more going on. All of these sites, I am assuming, date to the late 1st, early, uh, early 2nd century AD. Right, so a few key points. What's going on? We have to refer to the Romans. So as everybody knows, we have three sets of Roman linear frontiery things, because we obviously don't think the Gask Ridge is a frontier necessarily. So the Gask Ridge at the end of the first century AD, then there's a retreat down to the Stangate, which is what the Hadrian's Wall becomes. Then there's pushes forward, and we have a kind of up and down, up and down. Now, the thing for Stirling here is to bear in mind that Paris map. If you are going north, you have to go through Stirling. If you are resisting people going north, you have to do it through Stirling. If you want to trade with what is the biggest market in the world at that point, you have to come through Stirling. You have to go south. So the Gask Ridge, which is the most northerly, encompasses both the best northerly arable land in Scotland and the mineral resources of the Occults. So, if we have a look at some of the routes, so the dark blue relate to kind of passageways. Some of these are reflected in the modern uh, road system. So, for example, Stirling Castle, the town of Stirling, and Stirling Bridge are the main crossing point. That's the way the current motorways go. We have a much smaller crossing at uh, the Fords of Frew, which runs between Gargunic and Coldoch, and there is a tight cluster of sites in that area. I think that what we're looking at is people exploiting trade. So they are, their material resources in the north, they are being taken down south to feed the Roman market, and people are either taxing this, they are facilitating it, or there's a, a protection racket. And you would just depend whichever economic model you wanted to pursue. So we have a lovely reconstruction of this trade by Alan Braby. The site in the centre is Baston Burn, we think. We then have further more to the, to the right, we have Keir Hill at Gargunic, and then we have Lecky Brock but it gives you a sense of the distribution of these first and early second century sites. And obviously we have the, the cattle wandering down and across. The cut mark stones are just Alan being uh, artistic license there. Now, all of these sites end in destruction by fire. But what does that mean? Um, there, obviously archaeology is good at detecting destruction by fire, we are less certain about uh, establishing motive. So this could be an accidental fire, this could be destruction by the Romans, this could be an act of conspicuous consumption. When we think about the assemblage of sites around the Fourth Valley, Lecky Brock is often thought to be destroyed by the Romans, it has a ballista bolt within it, Moat Hill, which was the fort I alluded to, is vitrified. That's not an accidental destruction, that's a deliberate destruction. That takes days, if not weeks. Temperatures must be made and um, maintained in excess of 1,000 degrees centigrade. So that's a deliberate act. But there are also accidental acts. Now, 
One of the interesting things, of course, is that frontier. So there is a point where Stirling is right next to the Empire, and then there's a point when the Empire retreats further, and southern Scotland and northern England are that buffer zone. So it is entirely possible that we're looking at the collapse of an economic system when the Roman Empire, when the market moves. And you might imagine this is the sort of thing that happens when the steelworks close. The economy just collapses, people move away, structures are abandoned. It could also be, because we know from Lecky, it could be a change in imperial policy. One of the things about these southern Brock cognate forms is they're late. These are the latest Brocks in Scotland. People are still building them. It's a bit odd. They're not really building them to this nature in, in Orkney and Shetland at this point. They're also that architecture. It's a conspicuous consumption. It's showing off. It's showing you find wealth off. And the variability of construction and architecture across the Forth Valley is probably competition amongst small groups. I've got this. I'm going to get this. Mine's bigger. No, mine's better. Um, and this is wealth being shown off and, and, as I say, conspicuous consumption. The thing is, though, that a broch on the edge of the Roman Empire is a reference to both a free past and a free north. Now, so we, are, we have people that are treading a line. They are trading with the Romans. They are trading with people to the north. But this is a, this is a militarized zone. Everybody likes the Romans. We're all very keen on them. We, you know, see connections with our own empire for good or bad. But if I, instead of um, talking about the Romans and empire, if I was to talk about Vichy France and the Nazis, the, the whole metaphor for um, our interpretation of this zone changes. We've actually got people who might be trading secrets, who might be helping to organize raids, who might have to be punished by the Roman military. And of course, the Roman military is like any other bureaucratic organization, mistakes are made. Someone could say, destroy that Brock because uh, Lossio has been siding with our enemies to the north. And we know around the early third century that Septimia Severus's invasion of Scotland is directly connected with the breaking of treaties by the Caledonians siding with the Mephi. The Methi, incidentally, are the name of the people in the Fourth Valley, so Demiat Dun Methi. So it is entirely possible that someone has broken a treaty, uh, an action was taken to destroy them, but actually they got the wrong scabby brock looking thing on the side of the hill above the Fourth. But when we actually think about these kind of sites that we dig, we should be thinking about people's lives and actually the impact of military. However, all that's just the introduction, right? <laughs> We went to the site, we dug it, we dug one trench, which was broken up into smaller elements. We found what appears to be a substantial stone walled circular structure. It has facing on the outside, the wall is three to four meters wide. That was very good. We found vitrified stone, so it's destroyed by fire. We thought we found Romany looking pot, which was on Facebook for a bit, probably still is on Facebook. Then we also found, even better, a series of external ditches going out to your right, which is the east. And all of this looked like you have three or four banks and ditches on the edge of a ridge defending a brock-like structure that was looking out across Flanders Moss towards Coldock Brock. I even got another reconstruction done by Alan Braby, which has, this one's a bit fainter because this is just the rough out, but we have the fourth, and that's the north with another series of brock-like structures on the other side. So we have Cold Dog Brock, and I've forgotten the name of the other one. Right, great, job done. Then we started to get the post X. <laughs> the pottery is medieval. Ah. The radiocarbon date is Mesolithic, right? And the radiocarbon date is contemporary with the antler beam matic that I showed you earlier on. So there, that's quite interesting. Um, so, conclusion. Right. What we probably have 
is a Mesolithic camp of some description, which then has a brocky thing put on top. The brocky thing then is, uh, is home to a 15th, 16th century farm. So for my penultimate slide, it's all about location, location, location. <laughs> the same place gets occupied over millennia because the fourth valley restricts the more habitable zones. So the same spot gets used over and over again because it's the only available spot. So anyway, this was a very quick one because I anticipated at this point somebody would be running late and I thought I would make up the time. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for everyone in the audience who helped. And thank you very much to the Forestry Commission who funded the project. Thank you very much.